How's everyone doing? So look to your left and look to your right. They don't know what they're missing. I'm going to give you guys information that is going to set you up for the next five to ten years in your practice. Hopefully, I'll be planting some seeds that will make you think. It'll make you approach the practice of law a little bit differently than everyone else who, uh, who isn't aware of this technology. You know, I want to start with going back 30 years in time. Walking into a courthouse with a spark in my eye and a bounce in my step with a laptop in my briefcase, getting ready to, to wow my jury with a killer presentation, kind of like what we look at PowerPoint today, but it wasn't PowerPoint, it was before PowerPoint. And when I took that laptop out of my uh, briefcase and put it on counsel table, the judge looked at me and said, Mitch, what's that? He actually said, Mr. Jackson, what's that? And I said, well, Your Honor, it's a laptop. I'm going to be using this to show my trial exhibits during the course of the case. And he looked at me and said, where are you going to plug it in? Well, it's got a battery. It's got a battery that lasts about 20 minutes. I think that'll get me through my opening statement. And he looked at me and said, no, you're not. You're not using that laptop. What is this thing? You have to do it like all the other lawyers in town. And uh, fast forward to today, we all use laptops most of the time when we're in trial, right? Things have changed. And when I listened to uh, Jack speak this morning, what a great opening keynote. I, I was totally impressed by what he had to say and how he presented it. He talked a little bit about Cleo being around for nine years. You know, 10 years ago, Cleo wasn't here. And I want you guys to give some thought as to what may or may not be happening 10 years from now in the legal profession, especially when it comes to technology. Elon Musk said, I'm interested in things that change the world or that affect the future in wondrous new technology where you see it, you're like, wow, how did that ever happen? And hopefully today I'll share a couple of things with you that when you leave you'll feel the same way. It's game-changing technology. Some of it we're already using. Some of it's, you know, down the pipeline. But all of it, I believe, will be uh, used on a daily basis by most professionals, including lawyers, to help communicate more effectively, to help tell stories. And although I'll be focusing on litigation and trial, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about you can use to market your practice. You can use to brand what you do to create top of mind awareness, not only locally, but globally. You know, we've been communicating as human beings for hundreds of thousands of years. It started around campfires, we were cave people, and then with the printing press back in the 1400s, that changed everything. It allowed us to expand and communicate, not only locally, but globally. We went from the printing press to the Pony Express, to the telegraph, to the telephone, to the internet. The internet has changed everything, right? But there's something else besides the internet that's changed everything. And I'd like to ask you guys, how many of you, and raise your hands, how many of you have one of these in your hand right now? How many of you have one of these in your pocket or purse? Look around the room. Almost everybody here has a cell phone with them or in their pocket or purse. Uh, this is a game changer. And the reason this is a game changer, and I'm bringing it up today, and Jack talked about uh, mobile technology earlier this morning is that more people around the world have access to a smartphone with an internet connection than they do drinking water, working toilets, or toothbrushes. This is something that has already changed the world and we're just getting started. Experts are predicting Robert Scoble and Shell Israel, who I'll be talking about a little bit uh, later in my presentation when it comes to social media, when it comes to VR, will tell you that we're expected to see more change in the next 10 years in technology than we have in the last 50. It's going to pass by, it's going to change at an exponentially fast rate. And so hopefully today I'll give you guys some things to think about when it comes to change. Now, I'm going to be focusing on virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, artificial intelligence, and everything in between. But the reason I'm bringing up the cell phone, the smartphone, is that by the end of this year, over half a billion cell phones, both iPhone and Android devices, are going to be equipped with augmented reality, virtual reality, 
let's just say, uh, friendly tools, okay? By the end of this year, by the end of next year, over two billion devices that we can hold in our hand will be able to accommodate virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, all of which will be using artificial intelligence. So it's good to wrap your mind around the idea that what we're holding in our hands, the te technology we'll be talking about today, is potentially game-changing. I know Gary Vaynerchuk uh, was the keynote last year, and back in 2011 or 2012 when Google Glass first came out, um, let me show, see if this works. I've got the sound down. I had Google Glass on, and what we were talking about is using Google Glass when it first came out to try cases. I was going to be picking a jury in Orange County, California with my jury consultant back in New York. While I'm picking a jury, they're watching, the jury's watching a live video feed through Google Glass. How many of you have ever tried Google Glass? Okay, so Google Glass, when it originally came out, had a live video feed uh, device that would work with Google Hangouts. Didn't work very well, it was new. But the idea was to pick a jury have my jury consultant in New York watch what was going on while I'm picking the jury, listening to the answers, and then live feeding me in my earbud uh, questions, suggestions, maybe running the answers through a database and confirming whether or not, for example, somebody is telling me the truth as to whether or not he or she had been arrested or found guilty of a felony, stuff like that. So we're going to do this in real time, and that's what I was talking to Gary about. And we were testing out the, uh, the software and everything else, and it just really didn't work that well back then, but I was excited to give it a try. We had the judge and opposing counsel, everybody was on board with two cases that we we're going to be using Google Glass in. Unfortunately, I guess, well, the case is both settled, so we didn't have a chance to take it to trial, but it was my first taste at real-time interactive feedback from an expert in the middle of trial or maybe during a deposition, maybe during an arbitration or mediation. It's amazing to see virtual reality and what's happening today. The experts are predicting that the change that we've seen with the internet and with the smartphone, that change is going to be magnified by 100 with respect to virtual reality. Just so I get a feel for everyone in the, off, in the audience, how many of you have tried on a virtual reality type of headset? That's why you're here, because you guys know how cool it is, right? It's a game changer. If you guys haven't tried this technology on, go to Best Buy, go to a local electronic store that sells this stuff, and try it on. And it's not the top end line type of stuff, but it will give you a very good idea of what this technology is all about. It's I'll be referring to it as a headset, and the headsets that I'm talking about will probably look like a pair of sunglasses, they'll probably look like a pair of reading glasses. They're probably not gonna look like this in the next five to seven years. Uh, Robert Scoble and Shell Israel, once again, I'll get, get to them more, but uh, they were talking about by 2025, people will be communicating, more people will be com communicating with a mobile head device more people will be using those than they will a smartphone. So that's kind of what I want you guys to wrap your head around, literally, is these, these mobile head devices will be voice activated, eye activated, and everything in between, and they're going to change everything. I've got some definitions here if you want to pull out your cell phones and, and, and understand the difference between augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, it's up there. Augmented reality basically plays around with what's actually in the real world. Virtual reality uh, replicates an environment, but here's what's important, mixed reality. Mixed reality right now, uh, there are companies out there right now, Magic Wand's one of them with over a billion dollars in funding and they haven't even come out with a product yet where I'm being told that the experience is so good you cannot tell the difference between the augmented or virtual experience and what's happening in the real world. I mean, it's that good. Now, there might be a little bit of hype there. I'm not really sure, but it sounds like it's really, really good. The idea, you guys, is imagine my daughter's in her second year of law school at USC. We're very proud of her. And what I was talking to AJ about is I would love to see her down at Strands Beach. That's the beach where we live down in Southern California where we surf and run and do all kinds of fun things. I like to, I like to fly the drone. 
down at Strand, so I'm going to talk to you guys about this a little bit. And imagine her with her toes in the sand as a lawyer 10, 10 years from now, trying a case just before going out surfing. And what I mean by this is she has a virtual reality headset, and she has a virtual reality headset, and she, it's just as if she's in court. And while she's picking a jury, not just from Santa Ana, California, but she's picking a jury from around the world on a, on a complicated uh, intellectual property case, jurors from around the world are appearing in a virtual jury box, and the reality of what we're looking at is so clear that it's hard to distinguish the reality from what's actual virtual. Uh, the judge is appearing using the same type of a technology. You're bringing in exhibits from a virtual digital a database, maybe it's linked to Clio, okay? And, uh, and you're trying your case virtually. You're saving money, you don't have to fly witnesses from across the country to appear in trial, and it's real time. As a juror, when you've got these goggles on, when you've got these glasses on, and you look to your left or to your right, it's just as if you were in the room. You can't tell the difference. So rather than me try to tell you about that, let me show you an example of virtual reality, if you had those goggles on and you watch this video, if you look to your right or to your left, up and down, you're going to see scenery. You're going to see an environment. You're not going to see any edges. It's not like looking at the movie screen you're looking at here. If we could turn up the volume, please. Thank you. have your goggles on, that thing's right in your face. And, and with the technology that I've been exposed to, you can feel the heat. You can smell its breath. It's so real that I'm at my age, I get dizzy really easy now. It starts making me nauseous to my stomach with respect to some of this stuff. Okay, the point being is when you've got the goggles on, it's hard to tell the difference between what's real and what isn't. And even when you can, you can use it as an exhibit during depositions, litigation, or trial. This is big business, and that's why I wanted to just share this graph with you. Um, you know, $36, $37 billion uh, in revenue, and they're predicting the numbers by 2020 overall with all the industries to be about $110 billion, which is much more than the television industry was its first five years. So this is something that's just getting bigger and bigger. It's not going away. Um, yeah, Goldman Sachs predicts that the numbers will be $110 billion by 2020. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Magic Leap, and you might want to write this down, check out Magic Leap as they're getting ready to introduce their products. Hopefully by the end of the year, that technology right now is supposedly going to be game-changing technology. Once again, I'm trying to plant seeds, so if you guys want to learn more about virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, and I will be talking about some other things, you know, I highly recommend this book, The Fourth Transformation, by Robert Scoble and Shell Israel. Uh, both Robert's among the world's best-known online tech journalist, and Shell's written books uh, and contributes to Forbes, to Fast Company, and Business Week on a regular basis. Um, that will bring you up to speed on where we are in the VR, AR, and MR worlds. I highly recommend you guys get that. And think about how can I use this technology when I'm doing litigation, when I'm taking depositions, when I'm preparing evidence, and how will I be using it over the next couple of years when it comes to wowing my jury and my judge and opposing counsel during settlement conferences and if the case doesn't settle during trial. Jurors are going to be expecting us to, to sh use this type of technology in trial. The next thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is live video and 360 video. Earlier today, you heard, if you were in this room, Nicole Abood, 
uh, who's one of my go-to video and live video experts. She's here in the room over here. She gave a great presentation about marketing to millennials. And the reality is when we're dealing with millennials, when we're dealing with juries, they want to see video. They want to understand what's happening with video. And there's some cool technology out that I want to share with you. It's 360 video and live video on Facebook Live and Periscope. So let's see if this video works. We were up at Mammoth just uh, three or four months ago skiing towards the end of the year. And I simply held up my 360 gear camera while I did a run. And I want to show you guys what it looks like and why it's so powerful. I've got the sound turned off. It does have audio, but I wanted to just speak with you guys. So when I'm panning back, when you're looking back at that, what's happening is I'm just using the mouse on my computer back at the office to pan through the video that's displaying right now. I'm not turning the camera. I'm, you can see me holding it right there while I'm skiing. All I'm doing is skiing down a run that's probably a little bit above my pay grade, and I'm just holding the camera up like this while I'm skiing. And what's happening is it's filming in 360. So if you, the viewer, were watching this on your smartphone, you could simply move your smartphone to take a look at what's behind me, to take a look at what's in front of me, what's to the left or to the right. You can use your mouse. There's just more. There goes Lisa right there doing some great turns. You're looking good, honey. And uh, so it's amazing technology. Little $300 camera, okay? This is something that you guys can use to show, well, let me show you another scene right here. So this is the same camera mounted to the bottom of my drone. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is I want you guys to understand how easy it is to shoot 360 video. Now, the video you're seeing, the quality of it isn't as good in PowerPoint as what I shot. This is 1080 or 4K video. It's crystal clear if you're using it during litigation or trial. But as you can see, with 360, you can show the jury whatever they want to see. If they want to look to the left or the right, you're able to do that. And I think what's really important is in cases where you're showing a, an accident site or maybe a client's assembly line or possibly the location of you know, an incident scene, whatever it might be, you can have your investigator or somebody in your office, instead of showing up with just a camera, showing up with a 360 camera like this and simply walking through or put it on a tripod and shooting 360 video. And the trier of fact will appreciate the fact that if they'd like to see what's behind an object or what's to the right or left, they can easily do that. And during trial, you can show them. It gives them a better context of what's happening. This is the Insta360. I just want to show this to you. This, all you do to shoot 360 with this particular device, it's just another device, is you pull out your camera. And it's now ready to shoot 360. So the point I'm trying to make is, if I can do this while I'm skiing down a slope or flying a drone, you guys can do this when it comes to putting your cases together for trial. This is how simple it is, and it's not expensive. Okay, 360 video is a game changer, and it's also a great way uh, to make that impact and show the jury that you're a step ahead of opposing counsel, and you want them to see all angles of a building. You want them to see all aspects of a collision scene. You want them to see what it's like if, if you're representing a truck driver in a semi-tractor trailer accident, the view of that truck driver, not only looking forward, but what's happening to her right, her left, or what's happening behind him or her. It's just a great tool to add additional context to everything that we're talking about. So I highly recommend you guys jump on this technology. If you're interested in learning more about any of this technology, use your cell phone and take a picture of these resources. Uh, I have no financial interest in any of this. They're just great people doing good things. But experts.com can hook you up with a great virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality expert if you need one. Nicole's my go-to person with live video and live streaming. Uh, Malia and Kathy and Ryan and Robert and Shell are all VR, AR, MR experts. And Peter Diamandis, 
who I'm going to get to in a couple of minutes, uh, also is a leading expert in technology around the world. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the lifeblood of everything that we're talking about. One of the things that I was thinking of this morning when um, Jack was talking is how we'll be incorporating artificial intelligence into our software. If you have a case going to trial where, uh, let's say you're representing, what would be a good example? I'm representing a drone company. And it has to do maybe with an intellectual property issue on, on a particular design of a propeller. You put that information into Clio, for example, it links to an to a, uh, uh, a AI type of database, and it tells you this is the type of discovery you need to do. This is the type of experts that you need to go out and retain. This is the type of presentation that works in a product liability case involving this type of technology. In other words, it does the work for you. Everything we're talking about when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, applies to this technology, and it's going to become more and more a part of our lives as the years go by, especially as professionals and as uh, lawyers. Uh, Chrissy Lightfoot, does anybody here know Chrissy Lightfoot from the UK? So she is a leading expert. She's a, a lawyer over in the, in the UK. She's a leading expert uh, when it comes to robotics, when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence. And I had the pleasure, Lisa and I were traveling to London, and I had the pleasure of meeting her and having lunch. And uh, I encourage you guys to connect with her, book The Naked Lawyer, obviously very provocative, but she talks about Lawyers need to be real. They need to be human. They need to show their, their human side to connect with their clients. That was her first book about five, six, seven years ago, and now she's dealing with robotics. She's talking about a product, Lisa, which is one of her creations, that does automation. And it's a document assembly type of robot, type of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think there's some, some vendors outside that are also providing some AI stuff. But the point is, is this technology is here, this technology is going to be incorporated into the tools that we use. I can promise you, and I haven't talked to anybody, but I promise you guys that Clio is going to be incorporating AI into their products. If Clio wasn't around, like I said, 10 years ago, where do you think they're going to be 10 years from now? They're going to be pulling all of this, all of this uh, technology, technology into their database. So, you know, get up to speed on AI, get up to speed on the robotics and things like that especially when you look at IBM's Watson. I mean, everything that we're talking about, IBM's already allowing us access to the Watson uh, program. And we're able to go in and we're able to use the power of Watson to do research, to do um, a background analysis on any issue that comes before us. And what I've seen with lawyers is, although they're aware of a lot of this technology, they look the other way, okay? We're still doing things the way we did 50 years ago. Earlier today, David took the stage and talked about thinking forward and about taking risk, and he shared his marathon examples, and I loved his presentation. His father is a lawyer from New York practicing 45 years, and I immediately fell in love with the guy. But he, he and I were joking about what our case files looked like back in the day, especially when I first started practicing 30 years ago. Now everything is in our case management cloud-based program, right? So things are changing quickly. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Like I mentioned earlier, Shell Israel and Robert Scoble on the top are the authors of the book I showed you. But uh, the reason I'm showing you this, this video, and I'll click play in a second, is that uh, Peter Diamandis uh, is on the top, bottom right. And I was on an interview with the Wall Street Journal. That's Gabby Stern on the left, down in the far right corner. And Peter talks about his thoughts when it comes to artificial intelligence. Don't get bad, mad at me for what Peter has to say, but I think I want, you know, I think it's something we all need, need to listen to. It's really, uh, we're in a very transformative time. Um, I think that every aspect of uh, every industry uh, is going to be changing. And it's really a function of you as, and the fact that you're here tells me that you're already doing this, uh, as a professional, staying on top of it. But there will be a point in the future where the conversation goes something like this. Uh, no, 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 I do not want that human touching me. They could make a mistake. I want the robot doing the surgery, for God's sakes. Uh, and it may well be, you know, I don't want the, uh, the lawyer uh, representing me. I want, the, I want the AI that won the last 975 cases representing me as well. So there's going to be an interesting flip 
that could occur there. So he wants the AI that won the last 975 cases. We're probably a ways off before that happens, but that's the direction we're looking at. And that's what I'm trying to do today is plant seeds so that maybe 10 years from now, because you're staying on top of this and you're reading the books and connecting with these people and staying on top of what they're doing, this isn't going to be a surprise. And you'll be able to say, you know, I remember Mitch talking about that back at Clio in 2017. And uh, how many of you use BlueJeans? It's the live video platform that we use here. Anybody? So BlueJeans is another uh, new technology type of device that allows you to live stream with people from anywhere around the world. It's kind of like Skype on steroids. And it allows you to bring people in, to bring in other videos, to have live conversations during the events. Uh, very powerful program, but it's a great way to meet with experts is a great way to look somebody else in the digital eyeballs privately to get a good feel for whether or not you want to hire that person as an expert or to get a good feel as to whether you want to bring in that attorney as, as co-counsel on a case. It's a, it's a company that I highly recommend. They do a really, really good job. Sensory devices. Sensory devices, and by the way, why am I talking about all of this? I'm talking about all of this because communication and storytelling it's, it's all about connecting with people. And so while I'm speaking, if I had the ability to interpret how you are each feeling about this presentation through your body language, through your heartbeat, through different, you know, uh, your body temperature, whatever it might be, it would allow me to really understand how can I kind of tweak my presentation, what hot spots, what hot buttons am I hitting, and which ones are completely cold. And with sensory devices, that's the next wave, I think, of what we're going to be seeing in litigation and trial and, frankly, everything else that we do. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you. Uh, a lot of us have Apple Watches and Samsung Watches and things like that, right? How many of you have an Apple Watch or electronic watch, something like that? I have one, but it's in the drawer. I don't use it. But uh, the reason I'm not using it is the technology is not quite there for me, personally. You know, I, 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 I need it to do more than what it's doing. But the technologies out there with Fitbits, with wearable devices, where they're monitoring what our body's doing. They're monitoring um, our heartbeat, our burning calories, and everything else. Well, what's interesting is uh, David uh, Engelman, who's a neuroscientist, in his TED Talk. And I want you guys to absolutely do me a favor and, and, and Google him and watch this TED Talk because it's game-changing. Um, what David talks about is he talks about using sensory devices to communicate more effectively with others, using sensory devices to interpret what's happening in our environment. Um, one of the things he talks about is that as human beings, we perceive less than a 10 trillionth of all light waves. Right now, there are literally thousands and thousands of cell phone waves and other types of uh, interactions with the human bodies that we're not even aware of. And he talks about, in his presentation, how it's possible to use this technology that, that we'll be getting into to help the human brain understand something that it normally wouldn't be able to perceive. Um, he uses an example of uh, the Umwelt, I guess that's how it's pronounced, pronounced in German, and that, uh, I don't want to get this wrong, it's kind of off the top of my head, but he talks about snakes using infrared technology to understand what's in their environment. It's not something they can see or hear, but it's infrared. It's something that we can't do as human beings. He talks about how honeybees use ultraviolet light to understand what their surroundings are and what they're doing, what they're seeing, where they're going. He talks about a bloodhound looking up at a human being saying, how in the world do you not know that 10 hours ago there was a rabbit standing right where we're standing now? Or how do you know that, uh, you know, those types of situations. And, and what's interesting is what David talks about is that the human brain, the only access to information that the human brain has is it's through, you know, electrical currents and through things that our body tells the human brain. And so what he did and what his team has done is they've researched different ways to digest what's happening in the outside world and tweak it back to the brain to allow the brain to understand what's going on. And during his presentation, 
what you see is that he was wearing a vest that was interpreting everything that was being said, everything that was being tweeted during his presentation. And what he talks about is when dealing with the blind, for example, uh, this technology has become so good that when somebody will write something on the board or hear a certain sound, uh, they can actually, when a blind person hears a certain sound, they can actually understand what word's being uh, written. When uh, someone who is deaf, uh, you know, is, experiences a certain feeling on his or her body, they actually understand what's being said. It's mind-blowing technology. But the reason I wanted to share this technology with you is that imagine if, and this is the Tony Robbins deal, everybody in the audience had this technology on their wrist. Imagine if instead of paying $10,000 per seat to go to that event, you're appearing at the event by virtual reality. And it's just like you were there. Imagine the speakers up on the stage really getting a feel for what their audience is feeling and believing in while you're speaking. Imagine if you're a juror, a, a trial lawyer in front of a jury, and as you're presenting your case, you can feel the jury by vibration on your wrist or by maybe a red or green light on your wrist letting you know whether or not they're agreeing or disagreeing with your case as you're putting it on, or maybe a witness from the witness stand. All of this technology is technology that's here today and it's being developed. And I think what's important is when you take a step back when it comes to being a lawyer and litigating cases, it comes down to what we're trying to do with our court system is we're trying to create an environment where we can share the facts, we can share the evidence, so that the truth is ultimately able to be determined by a neutral trier of fact, the jury. And if this technology will help us do a better job of that, whether it's virtual reality, whether it's augmented reality, whether it's 360 video so we can see exactly what really did happen, if it's artificial intelligence, if it's sensory devices, all of these things will help us, I believe, uh, become more effective litigators, more effective trial lawyers, and my favorite part of all of this is you can use this technology not only in court, but you can use this technology to market your practices and to build your brands. You go to a community service event and you use the 360 video to share what your Rotary group is doing in the community and you share that on your website. Okay, the, the limits to what you can do are frankly unlimited, right? So. I hope that I've at least uh, given you guys a couple of things to talk about, to think about. If you guys have any questions, I would love to answer them for you.